yeah recording so yeah so you have a ring um that um has the identity right and then you consider a sub ring a subset of the ring right? so for the subset of the ring you can have uh four different things so uh, the first one is um you can generate an ideal from this subset uh, which is denoted by this um, subset around the parentheses um, and it denotes the smallest ideal of the ring which contains this subset right and this is called as the ideal generated by uh, the subset a um, then you can have um, like ra so you know you know the product of the ring with the ideal uh, can denote this set of all finite sums of um, you know elements of this particular form form um, so this um, is going to be yeah of course yeah this is going to be another um, yeah this is going to be like um, your elements uh, from the um, ring and the um, subset A all right and uh, you can have a set which represents the finite sums of those elements. Okay, yeah. Um, and of course, if your um, subset is the null set, then uh, RA just contains the uh, additive um, identity that is zero. And similarly, you can do it the other way around. So instead of R A, you can have A R, and you can also have R A R, you know, containing um, two elements from the ring and um, another element from the subset F A. Take the product, then add them. Uh, sorry, have the finite sums and have the set. Right. Um, okay, so now you have the principal ideal to be an ideal which is generated by a single element right and if you uh, have an ideal that is generated by a finite set uh, you have the finitely generated ideal so um, we're going to come to these terms uh, repeatedly okay um so yeah the notation is just that uh if you have the set a containing these elements then uh, the ideal generated by them uh would be like this right. um yeah so so you can have um left and right ideals uh that are generated by a subset um so for example um you know the left generated by I ideal by a is going to be the intersection of all left ideals of the ring R that contain A, right? So um, um, this comes from this fact that the ideal generated by a set A can be written as the intersection of all the ideals of R, uh, which include the set A, right? So for for the left ideal, it will just uh, have the intersection of all uh, the left ideals of the ring that contain the set um, subset A, right? Um, okay, so you can check uh, whether um, like RA is um, closed under addition and uh, multiplication. Um, it is closed. You, you'll just have to you know uh, deal with these finite sums. Okay. So um, um, yeah, R uh, uh, as a ring has the identity, right? We have considered that. We've assumed that. Uh, then um, R A must contain um, this subset A itself, right? So R A again um, is a left ideal of R, right? So um, it's an ideal because uh, first of all, uh, it's a subring, right? Um, it's a subring because it is closed under addition and under under multiplication, and as it also contains a, so um, it's going to be the left ideal um, for the ring which contains the subset. All right.
Right, so um, that was left generated ideals. Now you can have the same thing on the right side. So you have AR. So AR is going to be the right ideal generated by a subset A, and um, then you will have RAR is going to be the two sided ideal generated by A. So two sided, we do not use two sided term, mostly we just say when you speak ideal generated by any subset, you will have. Um, the two-sided ideals, right? and this is related to the um, tenth problem. Uh, I mean, it's kind of, I mean not totally related because a tenth problem on the P set talks about how um, a two-sided ideal can be irreducible, right? But but yeah, so this is a two-sided ideal. Um, if your uh, ring is a billion, sorry, I mean, if it is a commutative, um, and you have um, an element from the ring, then the principal ideal generated by this element uh, is going to be uh, the set of all R multiples of A, right? So, um, R multiples in the sense that, it, you know, it's going to contain the set of all um, elements of the form A times something from R. Okay, but if um, R is not commutative, then um, you know the set uh, containing like um, two elements on the ring and then multiplying it with A um, is not really um, a generated a two-sided ideal um, generated by A because it, you know you have to check if it is um, closed in tradition. In the definition of R A, um, n is not fixed. Um, the definition of R A wait. N is um, n is a positive integer, right? So you have um, a positive number of products, and you know um, then the um, finite sums of those. So um, it doesn't have to be fixed, yeah, I'm saying. So if n is not fixed, does this definition make only make sense if a and r are finite? I mean, um, Mm. Indeed. I think he did assume like finiteness somewhere, didn't he? Mm, yeah, I guess in the definition of ideal, it was there. I mean, yeah, the thing is, um, yeah, I mean, n varies uh, through uh, the different um, sums, but uh, it has to be a finite sum, yeah. Indeed.
but you know they treat uh, the finitely generated uh, idea kind of separately um, which kind of makes me feel like um, you can have an ideal generated by a non-finite um, set can you yeah I mean I guess you can um, this RA is just not that the RA is specifically defined to be uh, containing the finite terms finite sums terms yeah yeah r and a can be um infinite themselves but the we're going to consider a finite number of sums hmm. Okay, let's get back to um, yeah. Um, so um, you know, um, if you have this um principal idea that is generated by a single um element. And it it is a set of all um, R multiples of uh, the element. So. Yeah, let's see a few examples of this. Uh, they have a lot of examples. Uh, we'll consider some of those. Um, the trivial ideal um, that is zero and the um, the trivial ideal and the unit ideal uh, that is um, R itself are both principal ideals, right? So um, you know you can generate uh, zero from just um, taking zero, and you can generate R from taking the ideal generated by one, right? So the ideal generated by the uh, multiplicative identity will just contain all the multiples, all the R multiples of 1, and that is the ring R itself, right? Okay, so with Z, uh, it gets a bit interesting. Uh, so, um, you know, you have N, Z, so all the N multiples of integers, and um, that is also equal to Z, N. Um, and that is equal to the um, you know ideal generated by n, and you can see that this ideal generated by n is not finite. Right, so this is just in reference to what Hemi asked. Um, you're generating a principal ideal uh, from a single element, but the um, ideal that you're getting is not um, finite. Right. Um, yeah. And um, it's mm -hmm. it's also the same as um, generating the ideal from the negative of n. Okay. Yeah, and uh, of course, as we've seen before, um, every subring of um, Z. Um, not really this. I mean, yeah. Um, every subring of Z contains the you know uh, is of the form um, of the additive group, right? So every ideal of Z is principal because it can be uh, just generated by the n, right? So the thing that you're taking multiples of. Okay, so if you have two positive integers n and m, uh, then um, n z is going to be a, a subring of m z um, if and only if m divides um, n in z, right? 
So uh, the lattice of ideals containing um, n z is the same as the lattice of divisors of n, right? Because you know if you arrange um, these um, uh, the ideals of n z, that they are going to be um, hmm. Mm hmm. They're going to be of the form mz, right? So um, it will be an m must divide n, so you'll have a lattice of divisors of n. I'm not sure what the lattice of ideals here means. I mean, I'm not sure, but the last time I saw a uh, lattice of uh, anything, I mean, something related to algebra was in um, number theory. Um, so, something related to polynomials, I guess. But not sure what they mean here. Um, okay, so um, then if you have uh, like an ideal generated by two non zero integers and an n, um, mm -hmm. then that is the principal ideal generated by the GCD of those things. Okay, that also makes sense from um, what you've seen about GCD and um, sublinks in the last few sections. Hmm. So um, N and M are relatively prime if and only if Now the GCD, ah, right, so this, um, the ideal generated by their GCD is equal to the ideal generated by I, so that will be R itself. Mm hmm, mm-hmm. Showing what ideals are contained in one another. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. So, let's see what else do we have. The last example is about cyclic groups. Um, if you have a finite group, and uh, a commutative ring with the identity, then the augmentation ideal is generated by the set of G minus the identity um, from the elements of G. Um, mm -hmm. You generate uh, the ideal from this set, which is going to be. Um, finite set, right? So you will have a finitely generated set, ideal. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think the, what they say after that is important, uh, that if you have the group as cyclic, then um, the augmentation ideal is going to be the prime, sorry, the principal ideal um, generated by sigma minus one. Yeah, because uh, all the elements of the group are generated by this sigma. Okay, makes sense. Um, we have a few more um, properties of ideals, uh, some propositions. So yeah, let's see. Um, your ideal is going to be equal to the ring um, if and only if um, the ideal contains a unit, right? Um, 
and second is that if your um, ring is commutative then um, R is going to be a field if and only if um, is only ideals are zero and R. And this is a, a problem in the PSAT, the problem nine. Um, it is from um, uh, Van der Waarden's um, algebra, but um, the proof here is exactly what uh, the problem asks. Uh, except apart from that, the problem uh, asks you to like consider uh, like like from this kind of um, from this kind of commuted ring which like um, has the ideals only the null and the unit ideal then uh, what would its like uh, homomorphisms would be like where so that would be how homomorphisms work for fields um, so that is kind of the m more interesting part of that uh, but otherwise the proof is right here you can I mean it's not ideal to copy the proof from here but yeah mm-hmm does he use a lot of augmentation ideal interesting and that's the example that he talks the least about at least here, maybe he will talk about it later. Okay, so um, I'm not going to go through this proof because, uh, as it's already a problem uh, in the P set, uh, you know, you can just go through this and um, yeah. And uh, one of the corollaries that you can get from this is that uh, if R is a field, then any non-zero ring homomorphism from R into any other ring is going to be an injection. And this uh, is um, partly the answer to the second question of problem 9 in the P-set, uh, right? how to consider homomorphisms between fields. So, um, and it's kind of straightforward, right? So the kernel of a ring homomorphism is an ideal. So the kernel of non-zero homomorphism um, is going to be a proper ideal, right? And um, it must contain mm -hmm, yeah, and thus it's going to be zero because the proposition says, you know, um, R is a field if and only if it's only a deal to zero, right? Okay. Um. Yeah. So this kind of um like gives an idea about how fields work um like um how fields are nothing but pretty much um rings with commutativity and you know you just have the special ideals and nothing else and so it's a very special case of our uh, rings right uh, which we're going to see in field theory of course And yeah, so here uh, you have like um, the home, like a ring homomorphism from R into another ring. If R is a field, is going to be an injection. So injective homomorphisms are actually embeddings of one field into another, right? And you have automorphisms of a field to itself. Uh, they would be mostly um, isomorphisms. So this is important. Uh, because fields will be important when we do um, modules and uh, vector spaces, right? Vector spaces are going to depend a lot on fields. So um, when you try to construct um, like um, the dual space of a vector space, you know, uh, you'll have these um, endomorphisms, um, which are pretty much just isomorphisms of a field um, onto itself. So, yeah. They're interesting. Hmm. Uh, 
Okay, and um, from here I can also say that um, if you have D as a ring uh, containing the identity um, and the only left ideals and the only right ideals are 0 and D. So 0 is the only left ideal, uh, I mean 0 and D are the only left and right ideals and then D is going to be a division ring. So and if you have done a bit of um, a reading from the first a uh, few pages of this chapter, you will see how division rings um, are related to fields. And that's a lecture that we did not do, did not cover, but um, it should be right here around. Mm. This is about but yeah it is um related to the fact that um the only um left and right ideals you have as are the um uh, special ideals the unit and the trivial ideal itself okay. So we have um, this uh, important um, piece of ideal uh, ideals uh, called the maximal ideals, and yeah, we're going to talk a bit about that, which I believe can help uh, me think more about the problem ten. Uh, not sure, but yeah. So um, an ideal M, um, you know, from an ar arbitrary ring, is called a maximal ideal. If um, first of all uh, it is not equal to the ring, um, so this proposition's first um, claim cancels out, right? So it cannot be the ring itself, uh, and the only ideals that uh, containing M are M and S, right? So the only ideals that contain this ideal uh, are are this ideal M itself and the ring S itself, right? So this is a um, special case, special category of ideals. Okay. So um, a general ring, um, not necessarily has maximal ideals all the time, um, because if you have um, an abelian group which doesn't have a maximal subgroups and they give an example of such a group in section 6.1 exercise 16 mm-hmm yeah so this is part of something that we haven't done Right, like nilpotent groups and the p groups, something that we're going to see next week. Um, but yeah, it's, it's somewhat related to that. Um, mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we haven't covered the um, maximal subgroups nor the nilpotent subgroup, so we can do this. But yeah, so a maximal subgroup um, is a proper subgroup such that um, there are no other subgroups which lie between that sub maximal subgroup and the group itself. So, for example, if your um, if your maximal subgroup is M uh, and your group is G so M is a subgroup of G um, such that um, you know there is no other H 
uh, which is like whose order I mean which is like a not in between um, the two um, between the two the maximal subgroup and the group itself so that's um, in chapter 6 of this book um, and those are topics that we have not covered so we I believe we can skip this without much of um, an issue All right but um, they say that um, you know you can um, take these um, take an abelian group that does not have any maximal subgroups and then you can like make it into a trivial ring by defining the product between any two elements to be a zero right so in in if you have such a ring then the ideals are simply uh, the subgroups the subgroups themselves are going to be the ideal the ideals and there are no maximal ideals right So um, this is an example of um, a case when you can have a ring which does not have a maximal ideal. Okay. Yeah, division ring is equal to skew field. Um, it, indeed, it's like uh, one one thing shy from being a group. Sorry, being a field. Yeah. Okay, so we have a few propositions about these maximal ideals. Uh, the, the, so the first one is, um, if you have a ring with identity, then every proper ideal um, is going to be contained um, in a maximal ideal. So this is kind of tricky. We're going to see the proof and of the um, next few ones as well. Okay. So um, you have a ring R um, with identity, and I is a proper ideal, right? So um, R cannot be the zero ring. Um, the two identities are distinct. Okay. So now, if you have set S as the set of all proper ideals of the ring uh, which contain I, right? Then um, S is uh, non-empty, right? Um, because like it must contain at least one element, the idea itself, um, and it is partially ordered by inclusion. So if you try to, hmm, I have a partial ordering by. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure if I can imagine right away how that will work because partial ordering means do not have uh, this metric condition. Uh, it is anti-symmetric. Um, it is reflexive. Yeah, yeah. It it is reflexive and anti-symmetric. All right. It is mm -hmm. yeah so right so partial ordering um I'm not sure how you will do that with the inclusion but the partial ordering just means uh, you have a binary relation um which kind of um orders um some elements some certain elements of the set so um you know order in the sense that you know you can put y um above x so x is less than y or like x is greater than y and you can do that for some sets of some elements of the set right. um so it does not uh satisfy all the um 
conditions right so it's anti-symmetric and reflexive but a total um, order which is uh, another kind of binary relation um, that satisfies all the um, conditions it is anti-symmetric it is uh, you know irreflexive and it is connected sorry transitive. yeah transitive yeah. so we're a yeah you have a specific um, classification for certain elements but you can't do it for the entire set hmm let's see that's interesting maybe it can give an intuition about the problem 10 Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, I got it open as well. Uh, three and four, I see. So you see the asterisk there? Mm-hmm. Right there. Uh-huh. Okay. Mm -hmm. We're given a relation that is x is less than or equal to y, and as I mean, yeah, this is not necessarily less than or equal. This is just a symbol which has like these properties. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is interesting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay, so this reminds me of what I did uh, with Zon's Lama and the axiom of choice quite a while ago in differential geometry. He used uh, Zon's Lama to prove something. Let me get my nose real quick. Uh, but yeah, it has nothing to do with this, but um, do you think like um, it's the same thing that we're trying to prove in dummy input? Wait. Yes. Yeah. The reason that the T is introduced into your ideas is through the existence of classical ideas that raise the hell in the Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. I am. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's let's go through this. Interesting. Because um, I was kind of I had kind of the intuition about the second a uh, point of the second sorry second problem of the uh, tenth problem in the P set, but not the not sure how I had to put zone lemma for this. Um, okay, so let's see. So what we were trying to prove was that in a ring with identity, every proper ideal is contained in a maximal ideal. Um, okay, so this uh, theorem is about how um, every ring, um, which is like commutative and has the identity, um, has at least one maximal ideal, and then um, he has a corollary. Okay, so let's go to this. Uh, hmm. So every ring has at least one maximal ideal. Okay, so now how that works. Um, you have the sigma set of all ideals, so that was S. Uh, in our case, um, we order um, the set by inclusion, okay. Um, S is not empty since uh, 0 must be in there. 
um, but I'm not sure about the notation, but I like the notation is considered okay, zero ideal, right? Okay. Hmm. <clears throat> so this order, uh, this set by inclusion, um, I believe it means uh, like you take some of the um, ideals from the set of all ideals, and then you um, order them like. I mean, if you have like I, J, K, L, then you say that like um, I is um, a subring uh, of A, and then J is a subring of I, which is a subring of A, and then you have like this a chain of um, um, chain of ideals, and that's how you order them. Is it is it correct? Yeah, exactly. So when we have a chain, we do K. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, yeah, makes sense. Um, so, to apply Zorn's lemma, we must show that every chain in this uh, in the ordered set, partially ordered set, um, has an upper bound in S. Aha, this is so similar. I, I did exactly something in differential geometry. Good Lord, let me get my notes. Because it, there, um, he was like, you know, he was the kind of guy who, like, defined everything that he writes. And he defined the partial ordering, the, um, what total ordering means and everything. So it's kind of good if we can see what this upper bound, uh, intuitively means here. Um... Uh, I can't find my notes when I need them. Yeah, I is the upper bound. Ah, okay. So where was this thing? Yeah, he did it here, kind of. So this is the partial ordering. He, this is the Zorn lemma, which says that. Uh, a partially ordered set whose every totally ordered subset T has an upper bound in P contains some maximum element. So we're trying to have this in our um, theorem, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the upper bound just means that you have the partial ordering, uh, then uh, an element u is said to be an upper bound if um, everything else in the uh, totally ordered set subset T is like um, less than um, the max, the upper bound. Okay. Okay. Yeah, it can be confusing <laughs> because the maximal element is different. Um, the maximal element is such that uh, there is no other element in the partial ordered set uh, which will um, include it. All right. Yeah. So this was what you were saying about uh, how the maximal ideal uh, is going to contain all the other ideals, right? Mm hmm Ah, okay. Mm hmm Yeah, no, yeah, that, that was wrong. 
Yeah, I confuse maximum and minimum. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 The smaller cases for the upper bound. Exactly. Yeah. Um. So yeah. What they were trying to prove. Uh, ah. Yeah. This one. That's what I was thinking about all the time. If the, you have a division ring, then any module based upon this ring um, V um, has a basis, right? And w what more? Um, if you have a vector space, um, like I mean, every vector space has a basis uh, because um, any field um, is also a division ring, right? So um, because division ring. Um, from division ring you can have a like module and then um, have a basis upon there so you can have a vector space because uh, vector space is based upon a field and field is a division ring so this was quite an interesting uh, proof um, I've forgotten most of it but um, yeah Okay, so let's get back to our stuff. Um, we must show that every chain in the partial order set um, has an upper bound in um, sigma. Then uh, you have this uh, chain of ideals uh, A alpha, um, so that each for each pair of indices alpha beta. You have either A alpha is included within A beta or A beta is included within A alpha, right? Um, and then if you take A to be the union of all these um, ideals um, for um, an index, then A is an ideal. Hmm. Okay. Let's see. So until here, um, it makes sense. Um, he has the union of all the ideals. Um, that makes sense. Then he says that this union of uh, these um, ideals, I mean not all the ideals, it's a chain of ideals. Um, is an ideal itself and you have to verify that um hmm mm -hmm. yep so It's um, it's going to be wait. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm Mm-hmm. Mm. I'm not sure I follow. Um Is it? Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> no, Atia is as concise as it gets. Um, J is not empty for sure. Um, but yeah, if you have two um elements, two ideals from J, then there are ideals in the C. Wait here, what is a uh, C is a chain? Then there are ideals in the chain such that these ideals are contained within those ideals. Okay, okay, okay. So by definition of a chain, either A is contained in B or B is contained in A. So in either case, A minus B, that is uh, an element of the J. So J is closed under subtraction. Okay. Okay, so no matter what, um, you're going to have um, ideals from the chain that contain um, those ideals that you chose, isn't it? Yeah, you have an arbitrary union of uh, ideals, but the thing is uh, the union of ideals that you're taking are in a chain, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. Yeah, yeah, because otherwise it will be kind of like the topology, you know, um, all the uh, finite um, unions um, of the, what is that, open sets is open. Ah, okay, so subtraction works. Um, mm-hmm, so you can say that, um, Mm hmm. You, you have to prove uh, whether left and right multiplication works. Um. Okay. Yeah. I mean, if like um. The all the ideals that you're taking union of are closed under multiplication. Uh, the union itself is going to be also closed, right? Because, I mean, it's going to contain all the elements of the ideals. So, I guess. Um, okay. Is true for intersections? That's interesting. I guess we'll see that uh, sometime later, isn't it? Um, so here, um, that makes sense. So if um, A is an ideal, uh, we just uh, showed that, uh, then um, um, the ideal cannot be the identity right because the elements of the um chain cannot be the identity all right and hence uh this idea yeah then it's proper yeah um i Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the condition for checking, checking whether the. Is, I mean, otherwise you're going to have the uh, trivial ideal. Yeah. Okay, so this is in the um, set and A, uh, sorry, the ideal A is an upper bound of the chain. Okay. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And by Zone's lemma, 
which says that if you have a partial order set then um, what is that um, if you have the partial order set then every totally ordered subset has an upper bound uh, in P contains must contain a maximal element right so here the total ordered set um, subset is the chain isn't it yeah So you have an upper bound of the chain, which is the totally ordered subset. Um, and um, then uh, it must contain a maximal element of the set, and thus um, you know it will be the maximal ideal because you have the set of um, ideals in the set. Okay, so that was good. At least now one has an idea about how to use his own lemma and anything related to rings or ideals. Yeah. Um, he has a two, he has two corollaries. Um, the first one is um, if A is not the um, not the unit ideal, um, then there exists a maximal ideal of A containing A, and that is what uh, we saw in Demidon. Oops. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, an ideal has to be a subring. That's uh, one of the conditions. It has to be closed under multiplication. Okay, so um, assume R is uh, commutative, then uh, the ideal is a maximal ideal if and only if uh, the quotient ring that you get from this ideal um, is a field. Right, so um, that means this quotient ring um, has um, the null and the unit as the only ideals. The lattice isomorphism theorem. Did, did they do something like this? I'm not sure if I missed. This follows from the lattice uh, isomorphism theorem. Hmm. Doesn't look like he has mentioned it before. Yeah. Oh, was Yeah, there were four, but it was lattice isomorphism. Wait. Two forty six. Ah, okay, the fourth one. Okay, the lattice isomorphism. So if you have an ideal, um, the correspondence is an inclusion preserving the bijection between the set of subrings that contain the ideal and the set of subrings of the quotient ring. Yeah, I, yeah, we we talked about that and that did make sense. Um, so that is the lattice isomorphism theorem. Yeah, I I like I knew this as a theorem, but I didn't like. Yeah, I couldn't connect anything about lattices with this, so I uh, kind of threw the word lattice out of the window.
Okay, so from this theorem, which says that um, a correspondence between um, between a subring and um, and this a mod an ideal is an inclusion reserving bijection between the set of subrings of R that contain the ideal and the set of subrings of R mod the ideal the quotient rings. Right, and you have um, the example of this, which is pretty cool. Okay, so let's get back to that. So ideal M is maximal if and only if there are no ideals um, I with um, you know um, I containing um, M. Right. Um, by the lattice isomorphism theorem, the ideals of R containing M uh, correspond bijectively with the ideals of R mod M. So this is directly from the fourth isomorphism theorem. So um, M is going to be maximal if and only if the only ideals of this uh, R mod M are zero and the um, R mod M itself. Right? And by proposition, we see that M is maximal length and if and only if R mod M is a field. Yeah, because you know that's what you need to have a field, right? The only ideals are the uh, unit and the ring itself, the null and the unit. Okay, so that makes sense. The proposition above uh, indicates how to construct some fields. Uh, you take the quotient of any commutative ring R with um, identity by a maximal ideal in R. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, I didn't cover this uh, because um, the way um, the lecture notes that I was referring to, um, they first uh, got modules and then some specific conditions and modules um, to get. Um, vector spaces. Okay, so you have a few examples of this, um, how uh, a commutative ring, um, if it has, if its quotient ring of a maximal ideal uh, is going to be a field. All right. Hmm. The last example seems interesting. If you have a field and G is a finite group, then the augmentation ideal I is a maximal ideal of the group ring FG. Hmm. The augmentation ideal is the kernel of the augmentation map, which is a uh, kind of the canonical map, the subjective homomorphism onto the field. Mm hmm. Making FG the group ring, uh, the quotient ring of FG mod I uh, isomorphic to F and thus a field. Okay. Yeah. You're going through the examples uh, is very helpful. Um, you must do that. Um, I've been doing that. Um, and it's um, better when trying problems after uh, trying to prove conditions for these examples on your own. Okay, so we have a few more things before we're done with this section, good lord. Um, the prime ideals, of course. Um, you have a commutative ring. Uh, an ideal is um, a prime ideal if, first of all, it is um, not uh, the ring itself. Uh, and whenever you take product of two elements in the ring, um, whenever, the, so whenever the product of two elements uh, from the ring is an element of the ideal, then at least one of those A and B, A or B is an element of the ideal. 
Yeah, this is strange. Hmm. I mean, you have the ideal, then a product of two elements from the ring, and from this product. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. So whenever this product is an element of P, then either A is an element of P or B is an element of P. Okay. Okay. So let's see how this is related to the Z. Um. So if you have n as a non-negative integer, um, n z is a prime ideal. Um, given that you know it's a proper ideal already, uh, so n z is a prime ideal provided n is not equal to one, and provided every time the product a b of two integers is an element of n z, at least one of a b is an element of n z. So what that means is that whenever you have um, product of two integers, um, which is itself an element of n z, so it's uh, is an n multiple, multiple of n, then um, either a is a multiple of n or b is a multiple of n. Okay, so that makes more sense because um, that is just straightforward um, elementary number theory. Um, if you have the product as um, an and a multiple of something, then um, of those two factors, um, one has to be a, the um, multiple of that thing, All right? Okay. And uh, in terms of you can put this in terms of uh, division, right? So if n is not the um, zero, then um, it must have the property that whenever n divides a b, n must divide a or n must divide b. And yeah, that is straightforward. Um, and because uh, n is a prime number, right? It must divide. Um, if it divides a product, then it must divide um, one of these factors. Thus, the prime ideals of z are just the ideals of p z uh, generated by um, the prime numbers right. yeah okay so the proposition is that um, the ideal is a prime ideal in our if and only if the quotient um, is an integral domain right so if you recall what an integral domain is so integral domain um, is a commutative ring containing the identity um, and has no uh, divisors Right, so no, you do not have anything um, in the ring such that a b is equal to zero or b a is equal to zero. Right, um, and yeah, so the proof looks kind of straightforward. Um, so um, an ideal is going to be prime if and only if um, it's not equal to the ring, of course, and then. Um, you must have A or B in P for the product to be in P. Um, so now if you turn that around and uh, say um, in terms of the quotients, right, um, R bar um, is equal to R plus P, right, so R is an element from the ring and P is the ideal that you're taking the quotient ring of um, so R bar, which is an element of R mod P, can be written in this way, which is uh, what we saw back in last lecture. Um, and R is going to be in P if and only if um, R bar is zero in the quotient ring. Okay, yeah. Thus, in the terminology of quotients, P is a prime ideal if and only if R bar is not equal to zero bar, right? And whenever um, A B bar, um, that is like A B as a product is in the quotient, then um, the product of A bar and B bar is equal to zero bar. Then either uh, of these a bar and b bar has to be zero. 
Uh, I mean, it's just that you know, whenever you have like um, elements in the um, elements from the ring in the ideal, um, they have to be zero in the quotient ring, right? So if you have um, a r uh, from the ring, uh, if it is in the ideal, um, then r bar, which is in the quotient has to be the zero, right? So, um, yeah. So if a bar is equal to zero or b bar is equal to zero, so what that means is that, um, you know, um, there does not exist, um, I mean, the quotient ring is commutative, right? So um, that's the first condition for the uh, integral domain, and it has no um, divisors because, um, Hmm. Mm hmm. Because whenever uh, your product in the uh, quotient ring is zero, your uh, one of those um, factors is already zero. So you know you do not have any divisors, making it an integral domain. Okay, so that makes sense. <sighs> Now, um, yeah, from here you can just say that, you know, a commutative ring um, is going to be an integral domain if and only if, um, you know, zero is a prime ideal, so, okay. Uh, the uh, other corollary is that if you have a commutative ring, then every maximal ideal of the ring is a prime ideal. Every maximal ideal is a prime ideal. Um, every maximal ideal, um, if, I mean, if you have a maximal ideal, then the quotient ring is going to be a field, right? That's, that's what we just proved. And, uh, a field is, um, is like trivially, uh, an integral domain, right? It satisfies all the conditions. Okay, so that was it, um. Examples. The last example seems interesting. The ideal generated by x is a prime ideal in uh, Z of x. So Z of x is, of course, the polynomial, um, poly polynomials, um, you know, generated by the uh, coefficients, integer coefficients, right? Um, and since the quotient ring of Z x with the ideal generated from x is isomorphic to Z. Is it um it's, it's a prime ideal for sure um mm-hmm mm -hmm. Okay, so this is interesting. Um, but yeah, so this is an ideal which is not maximal, but it is prime. Okay. Hmm. Okay, so that was about uh, the properties of ideals. Uh, very important, we did that. So we have some more time. We're going to go through the other two sections. We'll try to skim a lot of it. Yeah, you've got a lot of problems in uh, Dummit. Um, and as JP said, you might want to try some baby problems to get your head around uh, maximal ideals. But yeah, so you know, this kind of tempts me to get back to Atiya um, beforehand and try some problems for chapter one, right? Because um, it might be a very good idea before we get to it. Hmm. For psychological reasons, it is sometimes convenient to denote a prime ideal of A 
by a letter such as X or Y. <laughs> Ah, wait, uh, have you seen this problem, uh, JP, the 19 one? It talks about something irreducible. Not sure if that it has something to do with our problem. Hmm. <laughs> Me neither. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'll try and go through some of mm -hmm. Where? Fifteen. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. See, I see. Interesting. Okay, yeah. So now yeah, let's uh, this uh, let's go through this section pretty quick uh, for rings of fractions. Um, I'm not sure if this is too important, but the CRT Chinese remainder theorem is kind of important, so we'll go through that. Um, but yeah. <sighs> so yeah, you have uh, the rings as commutative. Um, okay, so what you're trying to do is that um, I mean, it kind of looks a lot like a field, but it's not a field. Um, Yeah, so we're trying to see that a commutative ring is always a subring of a larger ring uh, in which every non zero element of the previous ring that is not a divisor is going to be a unit in the larger ring. Hmm. And when you apply this to integral domains, um, you're going to have that larger ring as a field. All right. Okay. <laughs> so let's see this kind of equivalent relation that they're trying to have. Uh, a fraction a over b is the equivalence class of ordered pairs a b of integers uh, non-zero integers uh, which are related on the condition that um, a b is equivalent to c d if and only if a d is equal to b c so you know that is the basic condition for uh, a fraction mm -hmm. Right, and on top of that, you have uh, the multiplication and addition of fractions uh, based on this. Um, so a by a over b plus c over d is equal to a d plus b c over b d, and the usual stuff. And they are well defined. Um, yeah, independent of the choice of representatives that you choose for each equivalence class. Um, you know, because we've already made the equivalence classes. Uh, equal by AD is equal to BC, right? And uh, they make the set of fractions into a commutative ring. A commutative ring. Okay? But more so a field, actually. That is the set of rational numbers. Hmm.
So we can try and do this for some random commutative ring. Um, and then kind of uh, have a way of thinking about it in terms of fractions. It's not necessarily fractions, but yeah, I believe that's what they're trying to do. Okay, so um, if B is a zero or a zero divisor um, in the ring, uh, which means that BD uh, is equal to zero, and if we allow B as a denominator, then we should expect to have uh, D would be equal to D over one, which is equal to BD over B equal to zero over B, which is zero, in uh, the um, ring of fractions that we have, the commutative ring. Um, but we cannot have uh, the zero or the zero divisors uh, in the denominators um, because, of course, we will have to because it is not well defined in uh, in fractions as we know. So we will have to like find a way to um, collapse this. Yeah, give me a second. Okay. Ouch. Hmm. Ah. So yeah. So we're trying to find a restriction which will, uh, you know, uh, restrict us from having denominators as uh, um, zero or zero divisors. Okay. So, um, so this theorem says that if you have a commuted ring, then D is any non-empty subset of the ring that does not contain zero, uh, does not contain any zero divisors, um, and is closed into multiplication, right? Um, so then, uh, you have a commuted ring Q with the multiplicative identity such that Q is the quote-unquote larger ring uh, that contains R as a subring. Um, and every element of D is a unit in the larger ring. So that was what we were talking about before. So this ring Q has uh, these properties, right? So every element of Q is of the form um, R uh, times D inverse, right? So that's because, um, you know, every element of D is a unit in Q, right? And um, Q contains uh, uh, R as the sum ring, right? So you can write all the elements in terms of R D inverse. In particular, if D is equal to R without the zero, then um, Q is a field. Hmm. Okay. Uh, the other is the uniqueness of Q, right? So if uh, Q is the uh, smallest ring containing R, uh, smallest, I mean, we don't know what's like 
in what sense smallest, but um, um, in which all elements of D become units, um, you know, in this sense. So if you have um, any commutative ring S with the identity, then you have a ring homomorphism from R to S um, such that it maps um, every element from the ring D, um, sorry, from the subset of the ring uh, R, which is D, every element from there to a unit in S, right? So this ring homomorphism does that, gives you units in the ring. So then there is um, going to be an injective homomorphism from Q to S, uh, such that when restricted to the commutative ring R, um, it gives you phi. So this, uh, I believe it makes sense, right? Um, because first, uh, you're trying to have um, the larger subring, sorry, the larger ring which contains R, the commutative ring as a subring, all right? Mm -hmm. So what you're trying to do then is uh, you have another uh, commutative ring with the identity, and then you know you have this ring homomorphism going from R to S, you know, making mapping mapping everything from D to units in S. Um, then from here, you can say that um, the injective homomorphism. Uh, which goes from Q to S um, when restricted to the uh, subring R uh, gives you this uh, ring homomorphism that we were talking about before, the lowercase phi. Smallest is defined by universal property, is it? Uh, I haven't, I didn't get the time, time to check a Luffy. Um, can you say like which page of a Luffy? It would be interesting. Hmm. I see. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. I see. Yeah, I didn't have the chance to go through a Luffy for um, too much of ranks, um, but um, but yeah, I think I should. I'm, I'm not sure if he gives any kind of interesting, um, uh, like. Categorical perspective, not sure, but uh, maybe he does. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like vitamins. Um, I mean, I don't know. Do you like uh, like Dummett more than Olafi? Maybe because Dummett talks a lot about examples and the intuition. Ah. Okay, so let's uh, get this fractions thing done. Um, what else? So this is the theorem, the proof. In section 15.4, a more general construction is given. The proof of the general result is more technical, but it relies on the same basic rationale and states as the proof of theorem 15. Readers wishing greater generality may read the proof below and the beginning of section 15.4 in concert.
As it, what is 15.4? Localization, ah! It has something to do with localization, interesting. Okay, let's uh, see that elementary proof first. Um, okay. So you have uh, F uh, containing uh, these equivalence classes um, from elements of R and D. Um, and, you know, it is, it, it is defined by the uh, equivalence relation that we just saw, which is that RD is equivalent to SE if um, the product RE is equal to the product SD, right? Um, yeah, you have to prove that this is actually an equivalence relation, um, and for that, you can see it is uh, reflexive. Yep, it is symmetric. Um, yep, it is also symmetric. Um, but yeah. You will have to prove that it is transitive, right? So you have um, three different pairs: uh, R, D, S, E, and T, F. So R, D is equivalent to S, E, and S, E is equivalent to T, F. So um, as R, D is equivalent to S, E, then R, E minus S, D is equal to zero, and S, F minus T is equal to zero. So you know, um, you know, you multiply these two equations, you get um, you know. Rf minus Td um, over E is equal to zero, which means um, you know um, E is from D, right? Because uh, D and E are elements D, E, and F from are elements from the um, subset D, right? Which we're considering under the uh, commutative ring R. Um, so e uh, cannot be a zero nor a zero divisor. So um, R F minus T D must be zero, which means R D is equivalent to T F, right? Proving that it is transitive. Okay. And you um, you know denote you insert this fraction notation uh, for this equivalence relation, and. You know, you uh, define the additive and multiplicative structure, um, likewise. So, um, this is how you define. Uh, so, you're we're essentially just trying to make an abstract uh, commutative ring into the ring of fractions, right? And uh, you define the addition and multiplication likewise, and then you try to uh, check if they are commutative, they're um, actually a ring and the conditions and it is pretty much easy to check because you're just going to use the um, you know everything the knowledge from um, fractions of course right. um, okay so that um, will give you the well-defined equivalence relation for having fractions that is the tilde um, then you need D to be closed under multiplication uh, and also that you can like add and multiply stuff there um, it is okay so let's see mm -hmm. yeah it's also not that I mean it's just a sub subset of R Right, so you have to, um, like, if two fractions are equal, then you have to show that, uh, like, the addition of them is equal to the addition of those two. Wait a second. Okay. 
um so yeah you have to just check that like um the other side also um has the addition and multiplication um as it's supposed to have right so that will give you the well defined structure on d um hmm and you might need to construct this injective homomorphism sorry injective uh, map okay Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's the the proof is like nothing too um difficult, I would say. You just have to do deliberately every check check every um condition deliberately. Right. Um for the multiplicative inverse, right? So you have D in the subset D. Uh, must be a multiplicative inverse in Q, right? So uh, if D is represented by this fraction, D E by E, uh, then its multiplication is going to be the reciprocal, right? Um, so that, like, when you multiply, you're going to get the identity. Yeah, it, it can be a good exercise to, you know, um, exercise your intuition about fractions and implement them on these rings. The uniqueness uh, for that map, so this is interesting. So you have this homomorphism uh, which uh, you know gives you units in S for all the elements in D. Then what you do is you extend this to a map uh, that is uppercase phi going from Q to S uh, such that you know it takes every element of q right every element of q can be written as r d inverse right so that is uh, from the definition of uh, q um, and it gives you a phi of r and phi of d inverse right so phi of r um, um, is going to be just um, an unit in s right and so will um, this be so because uh so if you can um have this then um you know phi is also a homomorphism so um you have to check whether this is well defined um so if you have r d inverse is equal to s e inverse then you know you have to um make sure that you know um you can have r e is equal to s d right so um and uh, when you restrict this to phi, the lowercase phi, uh, phi of r uh, times phi of e works nicely with phi of s and phi of d. So it's pretty much just checking uh, basic uh, conditions of homomorphisms and um, yeah, and trying to construct something um, which we defined here. Yeah, that's the big part of it. Um, another definition, um, if you have all this, uh, then Q is the ring of fractions with respect to this commutative ring R and is denoted by D inverse uh, times R. Okay. Yeah. And uh, if your R is like apart from just being a commutative ring is an integral domain, then um, and also D is equal to R without the um, zero then q is going to be the field of fractions all right or a quotient field of r hmm okay and you have this corollary which says that if uh, you have an integral domain Q is a field of fractions, uh, then if a field contains as another subring R prime, which is isomorphic to R, then the subfield of F generated by this um, new subring R prime is going to be isomorphic to the field of fractions. And um, it is not that difficult, you just have to construct the right homomorphisms and isomorphisms, right? Um, Mm-hmm, 
yeah, examples. They have a lot of examples. Let's see the first one. If R is a field, then its field of fractions uh, is just R itself. Because um, if, if you can see, um, like this construction that we're doing, what it, what it does is it takes a commutative ring and then it gives you something that contains the commutative ring and but has more structure to it. Right, so this ring of fractions is not just a commutative ring, it has more structure to it, right? Um, and when you have more structure to the commutative ring itself, that is when you make it an, an integral domain, um, the larger structure that you have upon it um, will have more structure than the integral domain, which will make it a field, right? So n now you have a field of fractions. Um, similarly, um, you know, if you just have R as a field, then you cannot really go beyond that. Uh, its field of fractions is just going to be um, itself, right? So this is uh, an interesting way to think about it. And it has a few examples, some things related to the uh, ring of polynomials. We can't really talk about them right now, but yeah, interesting stuff. Okay, so we are we do have some time. Let's see we can go through the Chinese remainder theorem. Um it is not that much that long, but yeah, let's go through this. <sighs> and I will be done with this chapter. Um yeah. Ah, two weeks of rings coming to an end. The Chinese remainder theorem. Um, I'm not sure if you guys have done this in like number theory. I have to some extent, but let's see how it works with rings. Um, we have to define uh, some other stuff for that. Um, so if you have like an arbitrary family of rings, um, then their direct product um, is the same as the direct product of uh, abelian groups, right? And then um, you apply multiplication component-wise to that direct product of abelian groups and make it a ring, and then it's going to represent the direct product of those rings, right? So you do that using the abelian groups. Okay, meaning that we need the commutative property of our abelian groups. <sighs> okay, so if you have two rings R1 and R2, uh, the direct product as rings R1 cross R2 is the set of order pairs um, of elements from R1 and R2 where additional multiplication are component-wise and um, yeah, it's well defined like this R1 R2 plus S1 S2 is equal to R1 plus S1 uh, comma R2 plus S2 similarly for multiplication right and uh, which means that you know you can have a homomorphism um, from the ring to the direct product right? um, if it has some condition, right? So um, a map uh, from ring R to the, its direct product um, is a homomorphism if and only if uh, the induced maps, um, you know, are component-wise um, induced map of its components, right? So uh, you have R phi going from R to R one cross R two or R cross R. When you like divide it into two components, they stay as homomorphisms, right? Okay. Hmm. So we have um, some other definitions uh, related to Z, and then we'll see how the Chinese remainder theorem works. Hmm.
Hmm. Yeah. Does anyone know like why this is called the Chinese remainder theorem? <laughs> um. Yeah. And I was just scrolling through this elementary number theory book that I had. Um. It was like back in like first century A.D. Uh, someone like uh, Sun Tzu or uh, I don't know. Like, I don't really believe these historical things most of the time because I mean there's not really that much reliability. Um, he um, like was trying to find this question, answer to this question that find a number that leaves the remainders uh, two three two when divided by three five seven respectively and um, when you generalize this to all the numbers uh, you have the Chinese remainder theorem right so um, I'm not sure but it's kind of helpful to look at what the Chinese remainder theorem looks in the non-general sense right just in terms of um, positive integers and uh, you know your congruences um, let me see. So I have this book as a paperback, but not sure if this is on my PC. Mm, not this. Yeah, essentially what the Chinese remainder theorem says that if you have like um, an array of like a sequence of positive integers n1 till nr uh, are positive integers and like you know the con two consecutive uh, positive integers are co-prime, right? I mean, yeah, co-prime in the sense that their GCD is 1, right? So if you have ni and nj then you take their GCD, then you get it as one. So what you have then is a system of linear congruences. So linear in the sense that you know your um, linear in the sense like your congruence is of the form ax is equal to ax is congruent to b mod n. You know, so you can like have it something related to ax um, minus b is some multiple of n, right? Um, that's where the linear factor comes from but so you have a linear system of congruences uh, going from x is congruent to a1 mod n1 um, until x is congruent to ar mod nr right so for all the positive integers that we took um, and this system of linear congruences has a simultaneous solution right Okay, so then you have to talk about how a solution looks like in congruences, but not sure. Uh, how many of you are familiar with like congruences and their solutions and stuff like that? Because I think before we get to our Chinese remainder theorem, it's kind of um, good to review that. I think Balto is, because Balto did a lot of analytic number theory, didn't you? Hmm. Okay, if people um, are like not familiar or not interested, then I can we can talk about it. Um, it will not take much time, and it is really interesting to be honest. Um, yeah, and it made sense to you, um, JP. Mhm. Mm Okay. Okay, Brian, you want uh, me to talk about the uh, congruences and stuff?
Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay, yeah, give me a second. I'll pull up that book for our congruence, sorry, uh, elementary number theory. We'll talk about that. It's very interesting stuff. But, yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, like, um, Balto has done, like, Balto, do you have any, um, uh, recommendations for, like, some analytic number theory book, something like that? I mean, I, I know the elementary one, but not, uh, too much about the advanced stuff. Okay, yeah, give me a second, I'll stream. <sighs> um, but yeah, so the, uh, like, well, uh, my PDF gets loaded um the general idea between behind this chinese remainder theorem is that you can um have a general solution to a linear system of congruences right and um congruences as you probably know were first um devised by gauss um and yeah, it's it's kind of interesting what the man can do. He I think he devised it by the time he was twenty four or something. Um before his PhD thesis or something like that. Ah uh. I should have had it, but yeah, I thought like uh, we would not need it. Ah. Uh. Okay, I think I got it. Yep. Can everyone see the screen? Um, yeah, so this is the book, um, Elementary Number Two by Burton, which I did around two years ago, or something like that. And he talks about congruences um, here. So um, a bit of number theory. Um, 
if you know what congruences are, linear congruence is just a congruence of this form ax um, congruent to b mod n, right? Um, so, and by what we mean by solution of this uh, kind of congruence is to find um, solutions to equations of this kind, right? So, um, so for example, if x zero is a solution to this um, congruence, linear congruence, then what that means is that a x zero is congruent to b mod n, right? And a x zero is con going to be congruent to b mod n if and only if n divides the difference of a x uh, zero minus b, right? So that is the idea behind um, this. And uh, so the question is, you try to find all the integers that satisfy um, such conditions, right? So then you will have the general um, solution for uh, linear congruence, right? And there are a few theorems. Uh, we're not going to go to the proof of proofs, of course. Um, but uh, your, a linear congruence has a solution uh, if and only if um, you know the GCD of um, a and n. Um, divides b, right? And if um, it divides b, then uh, it has the number of incongruent solutions mod n, right? So yeah, so this is important. Um, so this linear congruence is solvable if and only if the GCD of a and n is divisible. Uh, it divides b, um, and if it does then uh, the number of um, distinct solutions mod n um, is the GCD, that is D. Okay, so that is the idea. The proof is kind of straightforward uh, if you know what you're doing with uh, congruences, but yeah. Um, yeah, another corollary is that if your GCD is 1, then um, it has a unique solution mod n, and this is uh, you know if you if you remember what I just said about the Chinese remainder theorem, you have a positive integers which are co prime, right? So any two um, consecutive positive integers are um, uh, have GCD one, right? And this is where it helps. So if you have GCD one, then you have uh, a unique solution, a unique solution. Okay, so um, okay, so let's just see how you solve um, these congruences. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's nothing much too difficult, you know. You just um, you just have to do something like this. So um, if x zero and y zero are solutions then you can write x as x0 plus n over d t and you can do the same for uh, y right and this uh, is because ax minus ny is equal to b and you know um, from the definition of linear congruences you can do so and successively you can you know uh, increase the value of t and you know you can have um, you know, when t is zero, you'll just have x zero, and then x zero plus n over a d, and you know, x zero plus two n over d. You now you'll have um, uh, an arithmetic progression of this. So that's pretty much all you need to know, I believe. So if we get to um, the Chinese remainder theorem. There are a few other things, but, um, but yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, much of it actually comes down to solving uh, Diophantine equations. I, I mean, I guess you know that already. You know, equations of uh, these kinds. You'll have to find what x and y work for um, solving that. And this is the Chinese remainder theorem in terms of uh, congruences, right? Um, yeah, it goes back to first century AD.
um, you have these uh, congruences, linear congruences. It's a system, and uh, you have to um, find a general solution that solves all these congruences, and it is modulo uh, the integer of the multiplication of all these. So you know it is um, unique, but it's uh, modulo uh, to uh, the product of n1 till n r, right? And the proof of this is I'm not sure. Um, JP, you've gone through the um, theorem, but like um, I'm not sure if like this is going to give an idea about what that was. Um, like um, it's it's not too hard, I believe. So what well, the idea is that you know you first have the product, um, uh, right? So that is n. It is the product of these r positive integers. Now for each such uh, k. You know, you have capital NK, which is like N over N. So it kind of uh, gives you um, this um, um, another um, sequence, sorry, another product of these uh, integers mm -hmm. without the NK, right? So. Yeah, we know that these um, n's are, are relatively prime. Yep. So uh, GCD of this capital N K with N K is going to be always one because this capital N K always lacks the small N K, right? So you're going to have the you're not not going to have any common factors between them. Um, what else? Um, so when you do this, uh, what you do is um. What you get is you get this congruence, right? So nkx is congruent to 1 mod nk from here. Mm hmm. Dummett's proof is inductive, okay. I see. And this is actually also induction, is it? I don't even remember. But yeah, so um, what you're trying to do is uh, you have these uh, congruences. Um, so um, this x bar, which is another integer, which is made out of these a i n i x i plus a two n two x two up until r, um, is a solution of the given system. And this is not a good way to prove um, because he doesn't give any motivation for why he um, create such an integer but when you work with numbers it becomes more intuitive for example this example um, you know what, what you know was the original problem of Sun Tzu uh, which is that uh, you have to find the um, simultaneous solution to the system of three congruences that is x congruent to 2 mod 3 x congruent to 3 mod 5 and x congruent to 2 mod 7 so what we do is you first take the um, product of these three that is that gives you 105 then you have n1 which is the product without three so that is um, going to be 35 that is 105 over 3 that is 35 105 over 5 is 21 105 over 7 is going to be 50 right so now you get three linear congruences from this which is 35x is congruent to 1 more 3 21x is congruent to 1 more 5 and 15x is congruent to 1 mod 7, right? And you can um, find solutions to these pretty easily, um, you know. Um, you'll get, um, what is that? Um, x1 can be 2, um, so 35 times 2 is going to be 70. 70 is um, one more three for sure, sixty-nine. Um, then you have um, two uh, x two would be one twenty-one is one mod um, five, and x three will be one as well. So you have um, you, you, I think this is just like trying to find uh, through error, trial and error. You um, 
you know, find numbers that work. Um, so then the solution of the entire system is given by the format that we had here. All right? You have um, 2 times 35 times 2, 3 times 21 times 1, plus 2 times 15 times 1, and then it gives you 233. And 233 mod 23, sorry, 233 congruence um, 23 mod 105 is the unique solution to the system of three congruences that we had there. Right? So, this is the idea behind um, the Chinese remainder theorem, and that's that. So this I, I I got back to this so that you know um you can know what the Chinese remainder theorem actually looks like in terms of numbers. Right. So then um let's get to our algebra part. It's two more pages, right? Yeah. Give me a second. Okay, so um, the Chinese remainder theorem says that you have a uh, number of ideals of uh, ring. Okay, before that, uh, we have to introduce the co-maximal uh, ring ideals, right? So two ideals uh, of a ring are are co-maximal if their uh, sum gives you the whole ring R, right? Um, and we know that from the definition of how you add ideals. Okay. And um, again, the product of the ideals is just, um, you know, consists of all the finite sums, um, right? And if your ideals are like, um, generate our prime ideals of um, these um, prime ideals of A and B, then uh, their product is also going to be a prime ideal of the product AB, right? And this. Um, gives us how the product of the ideals of a number of um, ideals uh, is the is going to be an ideal of the finite sums of the elements of these firms. So this you can see how uh, is analogous to um, nothing really analogous analogy about that, but okay. So um, the main thing is that uh, if you have AI generated by this um, generated by this AI, then this product can be generated by the product. Okay, now state let's state the Chinese remainder theorem, and we'll try to prove that. So um, the Chinese remainder theorem says that uh, you have k ideals in the commutative ring. Um, then you have a map taking you from the ring to the um, product of um, these things. These things that we've seen, seen before are, um, you know, um, quotient rings of ideals, right? So R mod A1 cross R mod A2 up until R mod AK. Okay, so you have a homomorphism uh, going from R to the and how what it does is it takes an element of R and it maps onto um, an ordered pair. Sorry, not really an ordered pair. A tuple of um, these elements of these kinds. So R plus A1, the ideal A1, R plus A2, up until R plus AK. Okay, so this is a ring homomorphism and its kernel, which is pretty straightforward to see, is going to be the um, intersection of all these ideals, right? Okay. <laughs> if uh, for um, some ij, um, some distinct ij, um, ai and aj are two co-maximal ideals, then this map is surjective and the intersection of all these ideals boils down to just having the um, multiplying these ideals, 
right? Okay, that's that's because if you have that uh, as core maximal, then um, the addition of all these um, ideals are going to be um, is going to give you the entire R, right? So, so your R mod um, the ideal generated by the product of these ideals. Um, is equal to um, R mod the intersection of these ideals and that is isomorphic to R mod A1 cross R mod A2 dot 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 R mod AK ah good lord so that is the theorem now what does that have to do with the Chinese remainder theorem? Well, what this says is that mm -hmm. the quotient ring that you get um, from the um, product of ideals, right, is equal to finding the quotient rings with respect to each of the ideals and then uh, having the Cartesian product of those things, right? And why is that important or why does that have anything to do with congruences? Well, as you saw in the Chinese remainder theorem, in terms of the uh, congruences, we saw that to find the general solution. What you do is you first multiply all of those, uh, you know, moduli, um, and then uh, all of those positive integers n. And then what you do is you, uh, you know, try to find um, these capital n's where you divide each of them, and um, you know, try to get these um, congruences, congruences with respect to one. Yeah, and then for the general solution, you multiply them and you add them. So I believe that's the um, idea here as well. It's just kind of too abstract. <sighs> mm -hmm. All right. So um um. Loosely speaking, in Chinese remainder theorem, our goal was to find a solution, to find um, another congruence, another linear congruence, which is the solution to the system of linear congruences that we had. So here, what uh, he says, this uh, abstract theorem says, is that um, your R mod um, the product of ideals. Remember the linear congruence that we got, the, the solution that we got was mod the product of all the n's, right? So if you remember when we talked about 3, 5 and 7, the solution was mod 105. Alright, so this is what we did here, right? Um, the solution, the unique solution that we got what, uh, was mod, um, uh, mod 105, right? So this is exactly what we're doing here. Uh, we're taking the product of ideals. So ideals are the things that you're taking mod of, right? So the congruences that we saw here, uh, the n, the three, five, and seven, uh, in the algebra term terminology, you can consider three, five, and seven as ideals, right? And then you take the product of those ideals, and then uh, you're taking the mod with respect to that. Ah, <sighs> okay. And the theorem says that if um, you have a quotient ring uh, defined like that, then it's going to work for um, every such ideal, and um, then you can take the product, and it's going to be uh, equivalent to that, right? And this is how it relates to Chinese amazing. Does that make any sense, or I'm just blabbering? Uh, 
<laughs> okay, that's good. Otherwise, um, we're doing a lot of mumbo jumbo. <laughs> um, so let's just see this. Um, yeah, Brian, we're going to see this in terms of integers uh, in this page, and then we'll be done with today's lecture. We're all we're already um, too far into it. So the proof, um, the proof, yeah. He does it for um, k equals to 2 and then uh, applies induction um, for the rest of it. Okay. Um, so you take um, two uh, ideals, um, A and B. Uh, you have um, the map from R to R mod A cross R mod B um, defined by phi of R gives you the ordered pair r mod a and r mod b right so this is um in terms of like congruences right hmm where mod a means the class r okay the class in the quotient ring containing r okay that is r plus a so that's just another way of uh, writing that annotation um so you have to show that this is a homomorphism. It is a homomorphism because uh, it's the natural projection, right? It's the natural projection of R onto its components, um, the quotient rings. Now the kernel of uh, this consists of all the elements um, R that are both in A and in B, right? So it will be the intersections. Um, now. You have to show that uh, A and B are co-maximal, right? So to show that they are co-maximal, hmm. Now phi is surjective. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. So you have to show that they are co-maximal. Uh, phi is surjective, and that uh, the intersection is actually the product of the ideals, right? Um. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Mm hmm. So A plus B is going to give you R if you have that, then you will have elements from A and B such that your addition of those elements is going to give you one. Mm -hmm. Give me a second, I've got a call. Okay, um, yeah, so, um, yeah, so if you have the uh, maximal condition, then phi of x is going to give you um, 0, 1 for sure, and phi of y is going to give you 1, 0, makes sense, right? Um, Okay, so now um, you have R1 mod A and R2 mod B, which is the image of uh, R, any element R, in the ring under the homomorphism. Um, now, this, uh, if this is an arbitrary element from the um, product of quotient rings, then Mm-hmm, then R2x plus R1y must map to this element. That makes sense because when you apply the homomorphism onto this, you will have phi of R2 times phi of Rx because phi is a homomorphism 
plus phi of r1 times phi of y and phi of r2 uh, by definition of this can be written as r2 mod a r2 mod b uh, times 0 1 which is phi of x similarly for uh, the other part related to phi of y now you multiply this as you multiply two order pairs um, you know in quotation product where your product is defined component wise uh, you'll have 0 and r2 mod b plus r1 mod a times 0 and you add them component wise again you'll get r1 mod a r2 mod b see that is that means it is subjective and um, it works nicely so um, um, if um, a and b are co-maximal and your x and y are like this you have to show that a b is going to be contained at them within a intersection b um, I mean if you take any element in the intersection it can be um, represented as uh, cx plus cy from um, I, I mean that makes sense because um, c uh, you can when you like apply uh, phi on this you're going to get um, c times 1 which is just c and cx plus cy um, is going to be an element of the product AB um, because uh, x is in A and y is in B. Okay, so um, you know this makes sense for k is equal to 2. Now uh, you apply the induction for um, the uh, case until k and it should work. Um, and this is the part where they do the induction. Let's just skip that um, um, and see why, uh, it, how this relates to the integers. All right. So the special case with integers is when um, you have um, z mod m and z is isomorphic to the product of z mod m z times z mod nz right so this was exactly what we were talking about um, when we said this so this um, solution that we got um, is is isomorphic let's say just to mean similarity is the same as um, having the unique solutions for this and then you know um, having the in, in a sense the quotation product um, all right so this uh, this in, in integers it is kind of uh, straightforward because you know that mz and nz are ideals and their product is just going to be mnz all right okay mm -hmm. and they give some examples do they um, since the isomorphism in the CRT is an isomorphism of rings and particularly groups of units on both sides yeah, uh, yeah in particular the groups of units uh, on both sides must be isomorphic okay mm -hmm. so you have the following groups um, of units uh, Z mod M and Z with the product z mod mz with the product and z mod nz with the product okay and this is where uh, you uh, i think um, it makes more sense you have um, n as a positive integer and um, you have p1 to the power alpha 1 p2 to the power alpha 1 alpha 2 up until alpha k uh, is the factorization um, of the positive integer n into distinct primes, right? So this is related to the Euler's uh, totient function. So this is also something I believe you can see in the. Um, so yeah, so the thing is Euler um, 
had this function and then Gauss uh, sorry format had this function function and theorem and then Euler generalized it um, to something else and you get the totient function from there just to give um, an idea about what the totient function is this phi function um, um, if you have a positive integer n uh, phi of n is the number of positive integers not exceeding n that are relatively prime to n right so um, this is a very special kind of function um, phi of 30 is going to be um, 8 in the sense that there are 8 relatively prime integers uh, positive integers uh, relatively prime to 30 that are less than 30 so that will be 1, 7, 11, 30 and 17, 19 up until 29 you have 8 of those and that is what the phi function does right so this is the function by order um, and the you can have um, um, something Gauss uh, something did more with that uh, than Euler did or Format did. Right, so the formats. If you know formats, little theorem. I guess you sh you should be aware of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, formats little theorem just says that. Um, a to the mod um, a to the p minus one is mod um, one uh, is congruent to one mod p. But okay, forget it. Um, if you have p, then um, you have this uh, prime factorization, prime power factorization, which is what uh, we are seeing here. Right? Uh, distinct distinct um, factorization of primes so then um, z mod nz is um, isomorphic to um, z mod the multiples of z from this uh, from these prime factors and then you take the product uh, from the Chinese remainder theorem um, and it holds right and yeah and the and the formula is um, this related to the other function? Right. Yeah, this is kind of like Dummett should have like integrated some number theory stuff if he is doing something like this, or he expects people to know this already. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a multiplicative function. Uh, multiplicative functions are those functions where you know um, when you apply the function on a multiplication, um, it works out nicely. I mean, f of m n is equal to f of m times f of n, and m and n are um, relatively prime um, integers. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, but there is some like um, interesting theorem about this. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. And um, we're done pretty much. Yeah. So this was Chinese remainder theorem and um, its applications on the integers. Okay, um, any further questions or, or can we just end this here? Mm -hmm. it, it has already been long enough, but yeah, I guess it makes uh, some sense. Okay, um, see ya tomorrow. We have a PISA discussion tomorrow, so yeah, see ya then. Thanks for joining, Brian. Yeah, you want to say something? I'm just going to say it tomorrow. Okay, yeah. 
Uh, you were asking when tomorrow? I, I could not hear you. Oh, right. Okay.